It's a young man, uh, his name is Travell Coleman. Uh, he graduated from high, in Harlem from high school in uh, 1992, and which was quite an accomplishment. A lot of his friends never made it through high school, and he did. He graduated, went to college uh, for about a year, but his, his heart was really wanting to, to be in the music industry. That was what he, he really wanted to do. And so he dropped out of college, and he pursued a, a career in rap. And he took on the name G-Dep, which stood for Gangster Dependent. And he kind of got into the whole, you know, the whole gangster rap, you know, kind of thing. And uh, he did really well. In fact, uh, Sean Combs, a uh, promoter, singer who uh, saw, saw his act, uh, liked him, offered him a $350,000 contract, and, uh, and Travell was on his way. And along the way, eventually, he, he got married. He had a couple kids. Um, and then something strange happened. In 2010, Travell walks into a police station in New York City and said, I want to confess to you that I killed someone. And the police officer on duty thought it was a joke. And he, he said, oh, really? And he said, yeah. And he said, back in 1993, month before my 19th birthday, he said, I, I shot and killed a guy here in New York. And the police officer didn't believe him. And he said, well, you know what? My shift's almost over, and it's too much paperwork, so you're just going to need to go somewhere else. And he sent him out. Well, Travell came back and told another cop, I need to confess to you that I killed a man. And he said, well, when was this? And so Travell said, I don't know the, remember the exact date, but it was in the fall of, of, of 1993, and he told him exactly where. And the police officer went back, and they had these cold case files, and he was able to pinpoint, and, and Sean was, or, uh, uh, Travell was able to identify the guy that he killed, or that, that he shot, and he didn't know at the time when he shot him that he, they killed him. And the police officer said, well, what happened? He said, well, I was on my bicycle. He said, I was out. It was late at night. He said, I had gotten a gun, and I was just feeling kind of full of myself. And, and he said, I walked up, I rode up to this guy, and I stuck my gun out at him, and I said, give me your money. And Travell said, the guy just looked at me, and instead of giving me his money, he, he tried to grab the gun. And when he grabbed the gun, I pulled it back, and I, I shot him, and the gun went off three times. And the man hit the street, and it freaked me out, and so I left. And then I, I found out later that, that he had died. And the police officer matched it up, and right there on the spot, he, they took him into custody. And throw that, throw that next picture up on the screen. This is a, a picture of him. No, uh, okay, that's fine. That's what he looks like as his, as G Dep. That was his kind of his promo picture. Throw that next picture up. This is, um, this is Travell when he was in, in court uh, after he was uh, convicted of murder. But because he came forward and because he confessed his crime, uh, they gave him a lighter sentence. They sentenced him to 15 years to life. And Travell is actually scheduled now to get out um, in two, 2025, I think, is his first possible release date. What's interesting was in the interview when Travell was interviewed in the courtroom, and they ask him, how do, you, how do you feel? You know, you, you confessed, and now they're putting you away in prison. And Travell said, I feel like a horrible, horrible weight has been lifted. Guilt can do that to you, can it? You know, when we, nobody likes to, to feel guilty, but oftentimes when we, when we feel guilt or we know we've done wrong, whether we've wronged God or we've wronged someone else, it's, it's so interesting how instead of coming forward with that, we hide that. We try to cover that up. But like Travell, a lot of times we find that that just never goes away. In fact, like a snowball, it just seems to often get bigger. An interesting one artist said, you know, when I, when I heard the news that Travell had shot somebody, he said, I couldn't believe it. Travell was the nicest guy in the world. He said, though I always noticed he seemed like he was carrying something around. And he was. And that something was shame. You know, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict men of their sin. 
Now, none of us in this room like to feel conviction. We don't, we don't like to feel the sting of guilt. We don't like to feel the sting of shame. But what we forget is that guilt and shame are, are God's way of breaking through to us to help us get rid of that, not hold on to it and bury it inside, but it's to help us get it out and lay it on the table. There, there's a, a word that I wanna introduce you today. It's not, it's not a fun word, but it is such a necessary word for us to really be the people that God called us to be. Here's the word, brokenness. God needs to break us before he can really do something in us. Amen? Now, I want to I, I walk you through. We're in this series called Summer in the Psalms. And uh, we've looked at a couple of psalms already. And today, I, I want to look at a psalm where David deals with this whole idea of brokenness, where he is confronted by God with his own sin. And, and in that sin, he, he finds that as he allows God to just break him completely, that it works an incredible work in his heart, and in his life. And when I, when I was working on this, this message uh, last week, I, I, there was so much stuff. I'm, I'm going through all this, this psalm, and I'm just, there's so much things that I felt like God was saying to me. I came home and I told Wanda, I said, this is, this is either a seminar or I'm going to have to do a whole series just on this psalm, you know. And uh, Wanda said, well, why don't, you, why don't you take two weeks on this psalm rather than just one? And what Wanda says goes around our house. And you know, there's, there's Wanda, then God, and the whole, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of works. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do the first part of this this week where I introduce this idea of brokenness to you. And then next week, I want to come back to the same psalm, and I want to I share some other insights that I hope will really help you and encourage you in your journey of faith. You ready? I want to look at Psalm 51. I'm going to read it, a uh, so, selection of it from the New Living Translation. We'll throw it up on the screen for you. David says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Some of us can relate to that. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have what? Broken me. Now, let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sin. Re remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your way to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O oh God, who saves and I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. Read it with me. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. That's our memory verse for the week. What you desire, oh God, is a broken heart, a broken spirit, a willingness to allow you to take us to the depths of our sin so that you can take us to the heights of your grace. Now, again, none of us like to be broken, but brokenness is a necessary step in so many ways. That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about today. I realized when, in just kind of my own journey of faith as I was camping on this, how I didn't really understand brokenness for a long time. And, and I also realized that a lot of people I talk to don't really grasp the concept of what brokenness really looks like. So I wanna walk through that. I wanna talk about the power of this brokenness today. You ready? Here we go. Let me give, you, give me a couple of thoughts that I want you to take home. Here's the first one. Brokenness is owning the cause of our sin. It's me saying, I did this. I did this. Everybody say that. I did this. One more time. 
I did this. Now, th- this is a hard thing a lot of times for us to say. We, we are a species that loves to blame. I mean, you know, and, and, it, and it's innate. It goes clear back to the garden. If you remember when, God, when Adam and Eve sinned and, and, and God confronts Adam and says, what have you done? You remember what Adam said? The, the, you know, the, the wife you gave me. You know, I didn't need a wife, but you gave me a wife. You know, she's the one that made, you know, and he starts blaming. And, and ever since then, we found this, pro, this tendency to want to wanna blame the people around us rather than accepting responsibility for ourselves. You know, one of my, one of my favorite comic strips um, is the family circus because I just think it reminds me so much of growing up. And, and I love how in the family circus, if you ever follow that, you, you always find that whenever they confront the kids about who did something, none of them ever did it. It's this ghost. And I love this. Throw that comic strip on. Throw that up on the screen. I love it. The, the mother asks him, she goes, I think I know the answer, but I'll ask anyway, which of you broke my good plate? Yeah, and I, I love it. And I love it. The kids are all standing there with blank faces. But here we got these ghosts. I don't know. Not me. Nobody. You know, these these are all the cor- cor- you know the, the culprits that we that we want to blame. Look at me. Just want you to hear my heart. Healing does not happen within us until we come to a place where we own what we have done, whether that's to God or to someone else. Some of us have been in relationship with people who, who just won't ever accept the fault for what they've done. And, and when we won't accept the blame for the things that we've done, look at me, we never get better or whole. I love what the Proverbs 28, 13 says. Read it with me out loud. He says, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Circle that word confess. The word confess means to agree with, to say along with. Uh, it means I, I admit to what you're telling me I, I did. And this ownership is absolutely critical for God to do the broken work in us that he needs to do. I, I love in, in 2 Samuel 12, if you remember the story, <coughs> David is um, owning up to, to what happened. If you remember, he, he had this adulterous affair with Bathsheba. Uh, he tries to, to cover it up by having her husband killed. And he goes through this whole mess. And then Nathan the prophet comes in and he confronts David with this story. And David, he, he tells a story that doesn't seem to be about David. And David's all up in arms until Nathan looks at David and he says, you are the man. Now, David could have deflected he could have said, well, it was Bathsheba's fault, or you know what, uh, I, 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 I got caught up in the moment, uh, uh, or you know what, I'm king, I got a right to, to whatever I want. He could, he could have used a thousand different excuses, but he didn't. Look, look at what it says in 2 Samuel 12, 13. It said, then David confessed to Nathan, read it with me, I have sinned against the Lord. That's why I put the statement on your outline. You'll never find forgiveness for sins that you won't admit are yours. Now, again, look at me. Hear my heart. When, when we feel conviction, when we feel guilt or shame, when we feel that inside, it's not God trying to drive us away. It's God trying to help us own up what we've done so that we can get the hurt out. Brokenness is also, and this is really hard for us sometimes to embrace, brokenness is recognizing the catastrophe of our sin. I destroyed this. I destroyed this. When when I was camping on this idea of brokenness and I was reading David's words, I realized that one, one of the keys to David's brokenness is he did not minimize what he had done. And we do that sometimes. You know, sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes when we sin and we know we've sinned, sometimes we minimize it. Sometimes we go, well, you know what, it's not really that big of a deal. You know, God, God will forgive me. And, you know, we, and we, treat, we treat sin very casually. Or, or we justify ourselves and say, well, you know what, there are a lot of people who do a lot worse things than I do. And, blah, you know, and we, do, we do all that. And we really don't own the fact that that sin causes great pain for the heart of God, that it creates separation from him. 
Yeah, and the same thing when we do with someone else. Some of you have had that, someone who has hurt you, and you've confronted them for hurting you, and they go, oh, come on, you're, you're just being a baby. Or, or, you know what, that wasn't that big of a deal. You know I was just kidding. You know I didn't mean it. And, and what happens when, when that minimizes? Does that make that pain go away? No. We, you see, what helps the healing to happen is when we own the depth of what we've done. That's why sometimes when we talk about celebrate recovery, you know, one of the steps in, in recovery is where we make admission not only of what we've done, but we, we make amends to the people that we've wronged. Now, just walk with me with this. And when we make admission to the people and make amends to people that we've wronged, sometimes we think that's just about unburdening our own heart and just kind of, you know, ad, you know confessing and just saying it so that we can get it out. But it's also about us hearing from them the pain that we've really caused them. Because that's what God uses to, to help us understand the, the depth of what we did. And sometimes for those of us who have struggled with addiction, sometimes, man, when we're, when we're deep in our addiction, we don't realize how much pain we're causing to people around us. And we need to. Because it's that realization that gives us the strength not to do that anymore. Does that make sense to you? If, if, if you were to come to my home and you were to, to accidentally knock a dish off the table and it shattered, and you were to look at me kind of mortified that you did that, and I said, ah, don't worry about it. We picked it up at a garage sale. And, you know, it was just a, you know, bought it for three bucks. Not a big deal. No, don't worry about it. You know, your, your guilt level would be what? Two, maybe, at most. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still sorry I did it, but it's not that big. But if you knocked it off and you broke it, and I looked at it, and you looked at me, and my eyes were like this, and I said, oh, my gosh, that dish belonged to my great-great-grandmother. It's been in our family for generations. Now what's your guilt level? Yeah, for some of you going, oh, it'd still be about a two. <laughs> but for the humans that are here... <laughs> Of, not the cyborgs, but for the humans that are here, you know, our guilt's jumping up to what? About an eight or a nine, you know? Why? Why? Because we understand the depth of that pain. If you're not willing to embrace the level of the pain that you've caused, you can never allow God to fully, to fully heal you. I, I love how David, you know, owns this. And again, in Psalm 51, he says, for I recognize my rebellion. Didn't minimize it. It haunts me day and night. And listen to what he says. Forgive me for shedding blood, O oh God, who says, forgive me for shedding blood. It haunts me. I want you just to hear how David let God take him to the depths of what he did. That's why I put this statement. Until you understand the depth of the pain, you'll never understand the magnitude of the pardon. Let that sink in. Which is why it's important for us to allow ourselves to feel that. You know, there was a, a, a father in Texas that he made the news a few years ago. Um, he had a son, I think his son was 11, lived down in Killeen, Texas. And he, um, he had gotten a note from the school that his son had been bullying some kids. And so his father punished his son, but it didn't take. And he gets another note from school, he's still bullying. He's still bullying. He's still bullying. And the father said he, you know, he took away privileges. He, he grounded him. He sent him to his room. He said, he, he said, I did everything I knew to do. And he said his son, his son just seemed like he wasn't phased by it. He said, I, I tried to help my son understand. Don't you understand when you're, when you're bullying these kids, don't you understand what it's like to, to be humiliated or belittled? And the, and the kid just, he said, my son just kind of looked at me. So the father did something that some parents thought was a little over the top. Throw it up on the screen. He made him stand on a corner with the sign that said, I am a bully, honk if you hate bullies. Now, some of you are going, oh, that is a horrible father. You have a right to that opinion. But I, I just want you to get this. I'm not telling you it's right or wrong, but I want you to get this. Why in the world would a father do that? What was he trying to do? He was trying to help his son feel what the kids he bullied felt. Does that make sense to you? He was just trying to help him feel. 
As, as long as you don't understand. You see, sometimes we, we say things to people and they tell us it hurts, but we don't take time to really understand how bad it hurts. And because we don't think it hurts that bad, we keep doing it over and over again. Brokenness, brokenness means I destroyed this. I know how much this hurt. That's when we become broken. Thirdly, brokenness, and this is hard, brokenness is accepting the consequences of our sin. I deserve this. I deserve this. It's just us, okay? The church is a great place to confess. Let's just go ahead and unload our hearts this morning. How many of you be honest enough to admit you've said you're sorry to someone before, but you didn't really mean it? Oh, you liars. Come on, hold those hands up. You know you have. How many of you said it because you didn't want the consequences of what was going to happen? Yeah. You see, a lot of times, a lot of times that's our driving point. Is, is we, don't, we, don't, we don't want the consequences. But look, look at me. Hear my heart. But true brokenness is this understanding, I deserve whatever I get. I deserve whatever I receive for this. I have done wrong. I, I have hurt someone. I have violated God's word. I have, I have done this. And we accept the seriousness of that to a point where we really say, you know what? I'm, I deserve whatever I get. I want you, want you to look at the words of, words of David. Now, I put this question. I put this question on your outline. It says, a, a huge question we have to ask, is, and it's an important one. Do I want to right the wrong or do I just want to escape to punishment? That's a great question to ask. Because if you're just wanting to escape the punishment, look at me. I love you, but you're not broken yet. Look at what David says. This is from the message. I love how he says it in Psalm 51. He says, you're the one I violated, and you've seen it all, seen the full extent of my evil. Read it, read it out loud with me. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about me is, is what? Fair. Fair. In other words, David was so broken before God, he said, Lord, I have, I have violated your commands. I have taken a life. If you want to take my life, that's fair. You see, brokenness takes us to that place of understanding this is what justice is. And you got you to get this. You see, if you don't understand what justice is, you'll never understand what mercy is. If you don't understand what justice is and how we deserve, you'll never understand mercy. I, I loved in, in the interview with Travell Coleman, the guy that I was, I was talking about earlier, what was interesting was after he came forward, of course, it blew everyone away. Nobody could believe that he was confessing to this and people were shocked and surprised and, and all of this and you know, and sometimes you read a story like that, and he says, well, he came forward. You know, they, 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 they should have went really light on him and just said, well, don't ever do that again. You know, and I, th I think that's maybe what people, some people were expecting. What was interesting was after he was sentenced, and they sentenced him to 15 years to life, one of the reporters asked him, are you sorry now you came forward? You're going to have to spend the next 15 years at least behind bars. Are you sorry you owned this. And Travell smiled and said, nope, not at all. That's a heart that's truly broken. We're willing to own it. I put this on your outline. What's so funny is our human nature is that most people want justice until they're the ones facing it. <laughs> then we want grace. Let me give you one more. Brokenness is also the first step in changing from our sin. I can overcome this. Brokenness is the first step in changing from our sin. I can overcome this. You see, when, when Nathan the prophet confronted David and the Holy Spirit convicted David's heart, David became a broken man. 
And it wasn't just about seeking God for forgiveness for what he did. It was about also making him a better man. It was about him learning from his failure, learning from this, this sin, and be going on to living a, a whole different way. I, I love the passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 7 as, as Paul was talking about conviction and the, whole, the godly sorrow. He says, for sometimes God uses sorrow in our lives. Read it with me to help us turn away from sin. Now circle that, look that phrase, turn away from sin. God uses sorrow in our life to help us turn away from sin, keep reading, and seek eternal life. We should never regret his sending. In other words, Paul says this, this godly sorrow that God gives us that, that makes us feel that guilt and, and causes our hearts to be broken and become open before God, he says that's, that's the catalyst that God uses to make us into different people. Thank you, God. I love what Paul said in Romans 6. He said, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, read it with me, we too may live a new life. I put, so I put this statement, brokenness is never just about forgiving the past. It opens the door for a brand new future. Pastor Steve, how, how can I live a new life? How, how can I change from the person I've been to the person God really wants us to be? Well, the first step is brokenness. Because when I allow God to break my heart, that's when I give him permission to do something incredible inside of me. Amen? Um, everybody take your, whoever's got them, kids, teens, whoever's got them, I want you to take your glow stick out. And uh, can we dim the lights? Put the lights down, please. How many of you have ever used a glow stick before? They didn't have these when I was a kid. Man, we played with fire, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just amazed the world is still standing. You know, there, there's a, there's, you see this color in here and you, Inside of it, there's a, a little glass tube, and uh, there's something in there. I, I read it, and I don't remember what it was. It's some kind of chemical that when you release it, it, it really causes this thing to glow, but, but you have to break the glass. So if you guys want to help me, just break your, break your glow stick, shake it up. Everybody hold them up high. Look, look at the glow stick. That's very cool. Now, here, here's what I want you to get. This, this is a great visual of what God does. You see, when God breaks us, his grace can flood into our lives. His Holy Spirit can fill our lives. And lives that were at one time useless and dull and bland, God remakes into something new and beautiful. Hey, look at me. Hear my heart. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what kind of weight or guilt or shame that you're carrying. But here's the deal. You don't have to carry it one more day. Today, if you'll just open your heart, allow God to break your heart and, and, to, and to cry out to him. The Bible says when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David talks over and over in this psalm about, Lord, take away this guilt. Help me to, help me to live as someone new. And this is what God can do when we allow him to break us. Amen. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and take your communion cups out, and Chuck's going to lead us in a song here in just a second, and we're going to pray together. If you'll take your cup and just open the bottom of it up, and you can take the bread out and pull back the tab so you got the juice there. Brokenness is the awareness that we are guilty before God. The Bible says the wages of sin, it's death. But the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at me. Jesus died for your sins. So you don't have to. When we bring our broken hearts to him, God not only removes our past, he fills us with his Holy Spirit, he floods us with his grace, and he allows us to walk in harmony with him, all because of what Christ has done. And so this morning, I wanna invite you, Chuck's gonna lead us in this song. I just, I just love this song, it's one of my favorites. But as Chuck leads us in this, I just want you to have just a few personal moments with God. And I don't know what weight you're carrying. I don't know what guilt you've got going on or what shame you may be bearing. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how long it's been there. Today, God's grace, it's greater than all of our sin. And so today, in this just moment we have right now, would you just confess your heart before the Lord? Would you just admit before God, what you've done and where you've been, and would you ask him to forgive you just like he forgave David of the horrible sin that he had committed in his life. Look at me. Today can be the first day of a brand new life for you. A broken and contrite heart God will never despise. Let's come before him today as we sing. Chuck. As I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Oh, I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Praise God, just as I am. Father, we come before you and when we read Psalm 51, we're aware of just how great your grace really is. That you can forgive any sin, no matter how vile. You can forgive all of our iniquities. You can forgive all of our failures. You can forgive all of our past. You can do all of that through your great grace. All we need to come before you with is a broken heart. And so, Lord Jesus, we, we ask today, would you 
let your Holy Spirit touch each and every one of us. If there is brokenness in our lives that we need to become the people you've called us to be, then here we are, oh God. Break us from the inside out so that your grace can flood upon us, so that your spirit can be revived within us. We cry out with David, don't drive us from your presence. Don't us lose, let us lose sight of who you are. Wrap your arms around us, Lord, and never, ever let us go. Oh God, we hold in our hands the great provision that you have made. This bread that represents your body that was broken. This juice that represents your blood that was spilled. You suffered the punishment for our sin so that we could know forgiveness and grace and so that we could live brand new lives. So we humble our hearts before you today and are filled with praise and thankfulness and gratitude. We love you, O oh God. May we walk in your ways. In your precious name, we pray today and we give you thanks. And everyone said, amen. Amen.